In the next couple of minutes, we will try to give you a taste of the way mathematicians talk about knots. Yes, knots, like knots in a rope, not some fancy abstract term used by mathematicians. Even during ancient times, knots were of importance to humanity. For example, the Inca used knots to encode information long before the use of ink and paper. In modern times, knots are used for climbing, securing weights in construction, sailing, designs, and much more. A full theory of knots was developed when physics considered the possibility that atoms are actually not in an invisible substance that fills the entire universe, the ether. As weird as it sounds, scientists seriously consider this hypothesis since there were some good reasons to believe in it. However, when the model finally predicted a periodic table, it was too different from the one we know and the project was abandoned. But mathematicians did not stop there. Theory was too beautiful for them to quit the research. Only during recent years it was realized that this theory actually has applications in many fields, such as chemistry, physics, computer science, and of course, mathematics. The focus of this video is on the mathematical theory of knots, a field of research dealing with questions such as, what are all the kind of knots that exist? How can a knot be unknotted? In what ways do knots differ from each other? And of course, what can we do with the answers to these questions? So without further ado, let us begin constructing the theory of knots. First of all, how do we even define a knot? The standard picture of a knot goes something like this. A piece of string connecting two points that does some complicated path, maybe forming loops or braided into neat shapes, but overall it's just a piece of string connecting two points. Calling every possible configuration of the string a different knot would not be very useful for any purpose. For example, these two configurations are different, yet anyone would obviously call them the same. The definition often used for knot equivalents roughly means that you can move from one configuration to the other via a continuous deformation of the string without having it pass through itself while holding the ends of the string fixed. That means we can stretch, twist, and move the string around in space. The cases shown here are equivalent under this definition, yet they are not equivalent to a straight line. There is no way to move from these configurations to a straight line while holding the ends fixed. Notice that joining the ends of the string is equivalent to holding them fixed, since there is no way to separate them. That is actually the mathematical definition of a knot. A closed, continuous curve in space defined up to continuous deformations that do not make it pass through itself. Let us show a few examples. We'll start with the simplest case, a circle without any other feature, called the unknot, or sometimes the trivial knot. This is simply the closed version of a straight line, an unknotted string. Notice that this is also the unknot, since we can deform it continuously to a circle without having it pass through itself. And also, these two, even though they look quite complicated, even this one is an unknot in disguise. If you cut it somewhere and pull both ends, you'll indeed see that there is no conventional knot in the string. The most familiar knot, which turns out to be the simplest non-trivial example, is called the trefoil knot, and it looks something like this. When you cut it somewhere, you can see that this is actually the familiar overhand knot with ends attached. Another common knot in the theory is called the figure 8 knot. It looks something like this. We typically present knots using a two-dimensional projection, like these ones. This is called a knot diagram. There are lots and lots of knots, actually infinitely many, so we have to organize them somehow. The way this is usually done is by counting the number of crossing in the diagram, essentially a measure of the complexity or knottiness of the knot. These are diagrams with few crossings, while there are diagrams with many crossings. But there is a clear problem with this approach. Two diagrams representing the same knot may have different crossings. For example, these diagrams of the I knot have a different number of crossings while they represent the same knot. So we tabulate by the minimal number of crossings that a diagram of a given knot can have, called the crossing number. For example, the trefoil knot has a crossing number of 3, the I knot has 0, the figure 8 has 4, and so on. Knot theorists have a hobby of making larger and larger knot tables. There is a single knot with crossing number 0, 0 with crossing numbers 1 and 2, 1 with 3, 1 with 4, 2 with 5, then 3, 7, 21, 49, 165, 552, 21, 76, 99, 88, and it grows very rapidly from here. As of present times, 
No one knows how to calculate these numbers except by trying every possible diagram and determining which ones are equivalent, which is a hard task by itself. This series of numbers arises from a simple mathematical question. How many knots are there? To me, it is pretty amazing that something like this exists. It's so unartificial, as if nature has a few random favorite numbers, like the random ceiling digits of the constant pi. The rest of this video will deal with the question at the heart of knot theory. Given two knots, can we tell if they're equivalent? There are many methods for answering this question, but as of the making of this video, there exists no method that works in all cases and takes a reasonable time for a computer to execute. Usually, one has to combine a few methods. If one method fails to distinguish the knots, maybe a different one will reveal that they are indeed different. I encourage you to come up with a method yourself. It's quite a fun problem to work on, and most of the progress in the field simply came from someone thinking about the problem in their own unique way. Let's see some of the early but relevant methods for distinguishing knots. Arguably, the most important theorem in the field of knot theory is called Reidemeister theorem. Given any knot diagram, it is clear that applying these actions on the diagram, called Reidemeister moves, does not change the type of the knot. What's more interesting is that the inverse statement is also true. Given two knot diagrams that represent the same knot, one can move from one to the other via these three moves only. Here is a simple example. Here is a more difficult example. Pause the video and make sure each step is clear to you. Here is a third example that you can try unknotting yourself using only the Reidemeister moves. This theorem reduces a problem to a discrete combinatorial problem that a computer can solve, as the computer can just perform every possible move and check if the two diagrams become identical. It seems like we completely solved the problem. However, given any two knot diagrams, the current upper bound for the number of moves required to move from one to the other, given the crossing number n, is 2 to the power of 2 and so on, until you get to the final 2 which is raised to the power of n. The height of the tower of 2s is 10 to the million n. This is due to the fact that sometimes the diagram must be made more complicated in order to simplify it later, as in the last example. This bound is obviously ridiculous, but in principle we solve the problem. The theorem is very useful, and it, even if not for a brute force approach. I will prove the theorem at the end of the video. Another approach comes from the idea of coloring a map. When one colors a map, they want to make sure that no two touching areas have the same color so that one can easily tell them apart. Ralph Fox was inspired by this idea, and so he defined the following property of a knot diagram. A knot diagram is tricolorable if one can color each arc, meaning a piece of string connecting two undercrossings, by one of three colors, say red, green, and blue, such that all colors are used and at any crossing, all arcs are of the same color or of different colors. Here are a bunch of diagrams that cannot be tricolored. Check it yourself. It can help you grasp the topic better and shouldn't take more than a few minutes. But why is this property of diagrams interesting? After all, we wish to distinguish knots. We don't really care about specific representations of the knot. Well, it turns out that if two diagrams represent the same knot, and one of them is tricolorable, then so is the other. Thus, if we manage to tricolor a knot diagram and we prove that another knot diagram cannot be tricolored, then we know that they are not equivalent. For example, this proves that the trefoil is not equivalent to the unknot, since the unknot is clearly not tricolorable. Let us show this powerful fact using Reidemeister's theorem. If Reidemeister moves conserve tricolorability, then it is a property that is independent of the specific representation of the knot. Performing a type 1 Reidemeister move trivially conserves tricolorability. One can simply take a red arc into a red loop, and if we have a loop, it must be of a single color, therefore, transforming it to an arc will not cause any problem. Think about it for a moment. Let us examine type 2 moves. Going from left to right of course leaves the diagram tricolored. However, going the other way around might remove a color and make the diagram not tricolored. We can see that this is never the case, since both arcs must meet somewhere, and thus, the third color must appear elsewhere in the diagram. If both arcs are of the same color, then the move works in both directions trivially. Type 3 moves are a bit more complicated, but one can see it in the following diagram. 
Checking all cases of a particular move doesn't take much time since there is a finite number of possibilities. This finishes the proof. We just got ourselves a very simple and powerful tool for proving two knots are not equivalent. This is very difficult in general since two equivalent knot diagrams might look very different and every knot has infinitely many representations. Splendid! A property that is independent of a representation of a knot is called a knot invariant. This idea is a central theme of knot theory and one can use Rademacher's theorem to easily check if a property is indeed a knot invariant. Tricolorability is a rather weak invariant since it only partitions knots into two classes, tricolorable and not tricolorable. We can find much stronger invariants. One such invariant is simply the number of ways a certain diagram can be colored, and we can call it the tricoloring number. Using Reitermeister's theorem, we can show that this is indeed an invariant, and if we think about it, we actually proved it already. For this invariant, we typically count the trivial colorings as well. For example, the trifle knot has a tricoloring number of 9. This is much more powerful than just checking if something is tricolorable, since it assigns every knot an integer instead of a boolean value. The probability for two inequivalent knots to have exactly the same tricolorability number is rather low. We can of course also check colorability for a higher number of colors than three and obtain more invariants. Much more can be done with colorings, but let us look at another invariant that comes from physics, knot energies. Imagine we take a knot and charge it electrically with a uniform charge. And every bit of the knot will repel the other bits, and the knot will wiggle around until it settles into a stable position. For every knot, there are only a few such positions, typically one. And thus, if we take two knots and apply this technique on them, we can find their stable positions and check that they're the same. This is easier than checking general equivalence, since you only need to check their position is exactly the same. The name knot energies comes from the physical concept of energy. In physics, any system may be described by its energy, and the motion of the system obeys the following rule. Systems move, such that their energy decreases maximally at every instant. In the case of electric charge, two similarly charged objects will have an energy that decreases with their distance. As you might understand intuitively if you ever try to get two magnets close to each other, and thus, they will repel each other to decrease their energies. Knot theorists usually just calculate the energy of the stable positions, which is the minimal possible energy. The energy of the stable position of a knot gives us a powerful knot invariant, since it doesn't ha even have to be an integer, unlike the tricoloring number, and thus, the chance of two knots having the same minimum energies is minuscule. However, calculating these energies can be hard in general. There are even stronger knot invariants, each unique and fun in their own ways, but so far, no single invariant is both easy to hug it and can distinguish any two inequivalent knots. One might say that this is the holy grail of knot theorists. Knot theory has many branches, for example, a braid theory which deals with objects that look something like this. Braids may be added to form new braids and may also be inverted. Braids can form codes that are apparently very hard for computers to crack and so knot theory is quite useful for cryptography. This is just a single possible use of this theory, but its simplicity makes it a powerful tool for many other purposes. I think that's enough for a single video, even though much more can be said about knot theory. I mostly wanted to highlight one thing, this field is pretty fun. People bring ideas from physics, math, and computer science to solve the simply stated problems of knot theory challenging their creativity and adding to the collection of interesting knot invariants. Anyone can give something to this field, even if they are not educated mathematicians. If you're interested in reading more about knot theory, I highly recommend the lecture series by Anthony Bosman, whose link is in the description. It is a great introduction for both mathematicians and non-mathematicians, covering many advanced and simple topics with great clarity in a rather short time frame. He uses a bit of linear algebra, but those who have not learned it yet can still enjoy the lectures, since he only uses it a few times and not for things that are crucial for learning the topic, in my opinion. I also saw many recommendations on The Knot Book by Colin Adams, but I only read a few sections of it. There are, of course, many other good books on the topic, 
both for mathematicians and amateurs.